My name is Janet Krotz. I am the pastor at Faith Lutheran Church in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, I was ordained in uh, 2006. Beautiful. Thank you. Thanks for um, helping us with this project to celebrate the 50th anniversary. So I'd love for you to share, Janet, what is one of your greatest joys in ministry? One of my greatest joys in ministry is the children. I love the children. Uh, the children's sermon is my favorite part of the service. And if we run long, it's because I spent too much time talking and interacting and playing with the children. And um, they give me great joy. Uh, one of the little girls when, who came to our congregation about maybe 10 or, 15, 10 or 12 years ago, when she was about four, she said, Pastor, when I grow up and I'm the pastor, can I do such and such? I said, Lizzie, when you become the pastor, you can do whatever you want. And then a few years later, her brothers, we had a visiting pastor, and her brothers looked up at me and said, you mean men can become pastors too? And that was one of my great moments of being a woman pastor, knowing that, uh, that the, the boys didn't realize it could also be men. I thought that was great. Thank you. And uh, what women have inspired you in ministry? Um, lots of women have inspired me in ministry. When I was in seminary, I was pleased to meet um, uh, Rachel Conrad Wahlberg, uh, who was very inspirational. And um, it was a string. I can't remember her name now. And um, some other folks who were you know, heroes of the faith at that time. And um, uh, people like Kendra, who have uh, been in ministry, uh, my friend Vicki Taylor, other pastors who have uh, inspired me by their uh, leadership and, and their style and willingness to serve. Barbara Brown Taylor was a, um, quite an inspiration for preaching. Um, and at first I thought I wanted to preach just like her, and then it turns out I have my own style that's a little bit different. So, um, but I think those are some of the folks who have inspired me, not to mention the woman at the well and John. You mentioned the little girl, um, and I'm wondering if you know of other uh, young women or kids or uh, other women that you know that you have inspired. Um, well, definitely she and her sister. Um, because now she's in high school and still says that she wants to be a pastor. Um, and her sister is, uh, uh, doesn't have that inspir have, have that excitement, but she, uh, is definitely, um, uh, definitely a religious person. Her, their mom, um, has been inspired now to go, uh, she's in the Parish Lay Academy. And uh, I think she'll end up going to seminary. She's a wonderful leader in our church. And um, uh, other women. I guess I can't think of anybody else just offhand. That's perfect. Um, and I wonder, Janet, have you thought about how being a woman contributes to or shapes your particular ministry? Um, I guess for that, I would go to my call story because uh, when I was interviewed for the call at my church, I, uh, I was meeting with the call committee and the paperwork had said they were looking for a, um, a family man, somebody who liked children. And I said, I just want you to understand that I will never be a family man. I have a family. I love families, but I'm not ever going to be a man. And they all kind of laughed. And then they said, well, we think we have some people in the congregation who might not want us to call a woman. And so, what, you know, they're sort of in the closet. What should we do? And I said, well, the first thing you have to do is get them out of the closet and talk about it. He yeah. said, and the thing you have to understand is you've had one male pastor for 31 years now. You're going to have change. You're going to experience change no matter who you call. And there's going to be a point in the service when the pastor always used to raise his right hand and the new pastor is going to raise their left hand and everybody's going to say, oh, I thought it was supposed to be the right hand. And you're going to experience those kinds of changes no matter what. And in spite of the doubts of the synod office and everyone else, they called a woman. So it was uh, 
it, you know, that was a good experience for me. Um, and other ways uh, that being a woman has um, uh, shaped my ministry is that um, I, my profession before I became a pastor was as a registered nurse. So I carry a lot of that reg registered nurse, female, um, caring kind of um, persona into my ministry. And I think that that's made a big difference in the way I uh, interact with people. Are there other ways that um, having been a nurse helps inform or shape or prepare you for pastoral ministry? Yes, I would say, you know, you don't think about how um, people are so desperate when they're in the hospital or when they're sick or they're faced with that awful diagnosis. And for me to be, be able to not only give them pastoral care, but to explain to them a little bit about, well, why is the doctor saying this? Or why do I have to have this test? Or the doctor said, blah, 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 what does that mean? Um, to be able to explain some of those things with facts and with knowledge is helpful to them. And then other times I have no idea because medicine has changed and um, then pastoral care is, you know, really what I want to do. <laughs> for someone who might be considering a ministry today, what advice would you have for them? Um, do everything you can in your church, in your home church, and use the resources that your synod and um, other places offer um, to help you explore what the life of a pastor is like before you do that, so that you can make sure that that's the kind of thing you really want to do. Um, that you're willing to spend your days and nights. And uh, yes, you give your life for the Lord Jesus, but you don't give it all in one fell swoop. You give it day by day, minute by minute, days and nights, sometimes nothing, sometimes too many things to handle at once. And um, then learn about air conditioning and plumbing and um, electrical systems and sprinkler systems so that when those things come up at the church, you can do that too. <laughs> Learn all you can. Thank you. We're going through a big time of transition and have been, you know, mm -hmm. in this century and will yes. continue to go through transition. And I'm wondering what gives you hope for the church today and the church in the future? Here's the thing that gives me hope for the church of the future. I can think of two things offhand. Um, one is that I used to come to the uh, conferences and convocations and there would be a few of us women and a whole bunch of men and when we sang it was all big male voices singing and um, uh, now this this year especially at uh, convocation I have noticed that when we sing it's a blend of voices now there are sopranos to go along with all those male voices and so it gives me hope to see that, yes, change can happen. Um, it's been 50 years, and um, when I'm out in the community, uh, other, of course, I live in, a, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, so that's a um, center of more evangelical houses of worship. And so I'm not always recognized in the community as much as I would like to be, but... Um, I have hope that as more and more women um, get into ministry, that will help to change the church. The other thing that gives me hope is that at some point when I was a little baby, in September of 1950, I was baptized. And they didn't know in Pennsylvania when they put that drop of water on my head that I was going to become a pastor. And every time I think of... Um, that every time I do a baptize, do a baptism or think of it, I think we don't know what this drop of water is going to do, but we know it's going to change the church because here's a new person in the church and who knows what God might do in that person's life for the sake of the church and the sake of the world. We're going to switch to a couple of spiritual questions. Okay. And I'm wondering if you can share uh, 
a moment of God's uh, presence, a significant time where you had a palpable experience of God's um, real presence with you, where God's uh, presence was made real to you. Okay. I'm going to go back to, uh, this is before I was called, or it was the beginning uh, very much of my call story. Uh, I went with a group from St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Richardson to uh, Mexico City to visit the various work that the, that the Lutherans were doing in Mexico City. And we took uh, 10 youth and 10 adults. And we went around to these various sites. So at one point, we went to a place called Cartonlandia. It was called that because the houses were all cardboard boxes. And the people lived there. And we were allowed through a translator to speak with one of the women there. And she told us about her life there. And she was she had two children with her, and one of them was old and was young enough that I'm sure that child was born during the time that she lived there. And I was so struck by her story. And we asked her, What do you hope for? What do you pray for? And she said, you know, here we don't have a lot of uh, things in our life, but we have peace. And I said, well, we come from a place where we have a lot of things, but we don't always have peace. And at that moment, the, situa the contrast in situations of her life and my life was so strong that we got back on the bus and I couldn't get off the bus at the next stop. I was just overcome with the Spirit of God overwhelming me and telling me, you have to do something. You have to tell this story about, um, about people in other situations to try to overcome some of this discrepancy, some of this gap in the world. So at first I thought I wanted to be a missionary, and then as time went on and I went through discernment, it turned out, no, I'm not called to be a missionary. I'm called to stay here and tell people about the experiences in the world. So that was a very, um, certainly a very spiritual moment for me. Thank you. And what sustains you in your day-to-day -day ministry in the parish and in daily life? It has to be the Holy Spirit. I have to say it that way. That's really the only um, concrete answer I can give. And some people will say, well, that's not a concrete answer, but it is because I encounter the Holy Spirit in my prayers, my daily devotions, my um, working with other people, um, interactions with uh, members of the congregation and friends and people who say, how do you come up with a sermon every week? How do you think of what to say? And I said, I don't know, because it's only that the Holy Spirit comes and says, why don't you talk a little bit about this? And then once I get started, you know, um, those are the things that sustain me. That and the, the little victories like the children, like the children in the children's sermon who will suddenly give some totally theological answer to a simple question. Um, I think that's the thing that that keeps me going more than anything else. 